In one of the comments to one of our past videos, uh, one of you asked a question. You said, could you do a video on steadying oneself in the face of uncertainty? What do the sages say is the attitude that should meet the vagaries of life and the ensuing anxieties? It's one of those questions that I wish the answers were concise and easily attained. Uh, it, it's really one of the byproducts of spiritual life is having that equanimity of mind. And actually in the Bhagavad Gita, when it describes a, a man of steady wisdom, that's that's one of the most prominent characteristics is that equanimity in the face of all change. And so we get some hints from that. Within each one of us, we talk about it all the time, there is that unchanging manifest or unmanifest, divine spark, as it were, that is ever the same. And we don't pay attention to it much because it is ever the same. It's, it doesn't draw attention to itself at all. But actually our body, our mind, and the world that we've constructed with those uh, whirl around this center, as it were. And it's accessed uh, in a lot of different ways. Those are the different paths of spiritual realization. The path of knowledge, the path of devotion, uh, the, the royal path, uh, and the path of karma yoga, or work, or action. Each one of them brings you to that center stillness in a particular way. In karma yoga, it's just the remembering uh, that the moment alone is real, that the past and the future are, are machinations of mind, concepts of mind. And so to come into the present moment and make that the emphasis, and in the present moment, there is no historical past that's inferring a problem, and there's no uh, imagined future or projected future that provides a, an anxiety of what is to come. And so it's a matter of focusing the mind on being, on this, on this pure moment, and offering it as uh, worship, which is, becomes the motive, actually, for, for this imagined doing, for well, why we go to work, why we're nice to our neighbors, why we do well on our assignments, uh, why we uh, you know, keep our room clean, <laughs> all of those things. Uh, instead of doing them for a thousand different reasons, which then engages us in these ideas of anxiety and stress and discomfort, uh, we, we do it for a singular reason, and that reason causes the mind to focus on that equanimity of love, of being, of freedom, of knowing that you're not trapped in a cycle. So that would be the karma yoga approach. The bhakti yoga approach is the company of that unchanging stillness within the company of the beloved, uh, which guarantees that all things are founded on love and that all things are exactly as they should be. And we learn to take refuge in that perfection. We learn to hone our faith, to believe and understand and live our life and to look for uh, the things in, in the activities of the world that are done out of love for us through that relationship in bhakti yoga or the path of devotion. In the path of knowledge, it's going inside to find that self who is watching the mind, to become aware of the fact that you're not the one thinking, that you are watching thinking happen. And you have to do a lot of still sitting, a lot of practice, very subtle practices in order to, to have that become your dominant experience, in order for you to become aware of the fact that you are always watching. Your, your, the body always has to communicate to you what it's doing. So you are not the body, otherwise the body would not have to communicate to you what it's up to or what hurts or what needs attention. You would know. But it has to communicate with you because you are a watcher. And to practice seeing and understanding that with the mind, you also are just the watcher of the mind. That when you, when you think you're the one thinking, your mind is actually reflecting stuff back to you and you're observing it. So again, it necessitates the fact that you are not the mind. And so by becoming established in this witness uh, mode, where you, you, you understand that your nature is Satchitananda, that it is divine love, that it is uh, divine intelligence, and the existence, this experience of being, and all three of those provide a very rich mantle of uh, stillness, of equanimity, 
of buffer zone between that unchanging, always healthy, always perfect self and the seemingly changing world of the body and mind. And then the path of Raja Yoga, or the path of the royal path, uh, seeks for that same sort of equilibrium in the fact that you're trying to still thought. So, you know, in order for our mind to come to a particular state of being, it has to stack a few thoughts together. This thought, and this thought, and this thought, and they all imply each other, and they place the mind in a state. When a mind sits or achieves a particular state, then incoming information is processed through that state and gives it a slant. And through Raja Yoga, you kind of dismantle that function. You learn to slow the thought down with the knowledge that this ocean, this stillness of the lake of mind, reflects that unchanging self. When the fingers of me and mine, when the confusion of me and mine, are not stirring the waters of the mind. And so again, that separation provides that buffer uh, by which that, that equanimity of mind is attained. So that's the much too long answer and the much too long practice for achieving that equanimity of mind. But that is the practical answer. And it's not like you have to do that for X number of years in order for it to happen. You can do it for a few weeks, and if you practice with earnestness and sincerity, uh, then you can touch the beginnings of those things rather quickly. So it's really a matter of how sincere and earnest we are in our practice. Now the mantra, you know, which is used in many of those practices, uh, and maybe in all of those practices in a way, that mantra is entertaining the mind, that the mind that's, that is the thing that provides us with anxiety, gets into states of anxiety, states of worry. Uh, it's the, the mind that gets us into states of anger or states of loneliness or states of depression. You know, as soon as we become aware of the processes that, we're, that we are uh, initiating that bring us into those states, then, then we have the power to undo them or at least recognize them only as states and not interpret them as reality. And so they become available as malleable experiences, uh, which is a very important place to reach and a very empowering place to reach when you realize that you are in charge. The mind, which presents all these states, which, which is the anxiety you're talking about, which is the constant changing instability of the world, uh, that, that that is only mind. And that the reason that you experience all of that change and all of that vibration is because you are not moving. You are not changing. That you that has been looking out of your eyes when you were five, and now maybe looking out of your eyes at 25, that experience of self is the same. It's always been a steady constant. It is the, it is the, the, the eye that follows the changing body and changing mind all the time. And because of its unchanging nature, it then can observe change. We've talked about that in some of our other videos. So that's kind of an added little piece. To, to have a, a name of God or a mantra, and if you don't have a teacher to give you one, uh, you can either pray for one and, and, and initiate that process, or you can use a word like love, uh, or you can use the word, uh, the phrase from, uh, from the Christian ideal, which is, what is that a mantra? Uh, Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me. That's the one that the Way of the Pilgrim uses. And just to use a mantra which places the mind before this ideal of stillness and strength and love and grace and mercy, uh, that that becomes our default place. And when the mind starts getting caught up in worry or get caught up in loneliness or getting caught up in any one of these other states that it has constructed out of a series of thinkings, a series of thoughts, the mantra can provide you an instant escape from that. You can just hand the mantra to the mind and says, you know what, instead of, instead of building that make-believe world of worry, imagining who could fall off the cliff and who's not going to fall off the cliff, instead of dealing with that, just utter the name of God and be reminded of the stillness of self, which is eternal and immortal. So I hope that's helpful, Nathan. It might be longer and more involved than what you want, but I'm available if you want to give me, uh, to, to text some more or ask some more questions or get some more pointers. Anyway, 
Tomorrow we're going to start a six-part series on this internal prayer, this internal contemplative state.